It could take, you know, opportunities away from me in those two hours. But if I spend two hours gaming, that's suddenly a, a, a less appropriate temptation. I don't really, really understand that. I mean, I could spend two hours, three hours, four hours doing everything else and somehow that thing is more acceptable than playing games. Um, I just don't really believe that. I don't think you would say that about films. I don't think you would say, the scripture tells us to run from temptation. That means don't watch movies. Your destiny is at stake. You know why he doesn't say that? Because he watches a hell of a lot of movies, I bet. All right, welcome back, everyone. It is Friday, June 9th, I believe, which is the day before the first press conference, and it's EA's turn. Um, it's going to be pretty crazy tomorrow, even though, you know, EA is probably the press conference that people are least excited about. But at the same time, they do have Star Wars coming up, and I think that reinvigorates that press conference to a point where people are expecting that. I remember... Um, the past two specifically where people were just like, okay, let's get on with the FIFA, let's get on with all that stuff, the Maddens, and let's focus on, uh, you know, Star Wars. And the new Visceral game is probably going to get an, a new trailer. Bioware has an open world game, but we'll get to that later. First, we're going to start the rundown with, you know, CD Projekt Red and the fact that they got hacked. Now, this is a very interesting situation for them because they obviously... Um, I don't know who has leverage, right? You would think that the people that have the information have the leverage. But at the same time, I think if you have a smart PR team and you, you know, release uh, a, a statement that really details uh, what they stole and maybe they have the information on it, maybe they don't. Maybe it's the type of situation where they know they got this, um, I don't know if they got a message sent to them or if they uh, got a call or if it was just a random email from somebody. But basically, the people that stole this sent a email or message, whatever, to CD Projekt Red, basically saying, we have your information, we stole it, and held it as ransom. So I don't know if they want cash or what they want. But um, they released a statement basically saying, an unidentified individual or individuals have just informed us they are in possession of a few internal files belonging to CD Projekt Red. Among them are documents connected to early designs for the upcoming game Cyberpunk 2077. And we'll talk a little later about how that game is going to come out and when they're going to release their first uh, trailer or their first image or whatever. But um, as far as this statement goes, it's very important for a studio to have a smart PR team to come out with a statement that not only says that we're not going to abide by these terrorists, we're not going to negotiate with these people and give them money or give them what they want. Instead, we're going to release a statement that says this stuff, even if it does get released, it's early. You know, it's early footage. It's uh, textures that were, were not polished. It's stuff that is not representative of the current state of the game. And that's very important for them to say because you know what's going to happen. People are going to get a hold of this information. And uh, you know how the internet works. And people are going to say, whoa, CD Projekt Red looks disgusting. Like, why isn't it more polished? Is this a representative of what the game looks like right now? Um, are they even close to releasing the game? And this is the kind of thing that happens when you live in, um, on the internet. And, you know, you have so many people expressing their opinions, including myself. Um, but I think they're in good shape because not only do they have goodwill with their audience, their audience is probably pissed off that some knuckleheads decided to hack them and steal their information. Um, so I feel like not only is, is CD Projekt Red in a good place with their fans, with the, with the overall video game audience, um, because of the success of The Witcher 3 and the expansions and the price and the value that you get from that experience. But, um, you know, this, this, this statement was, was direct and simple and felt like it was honest. It didn't feel like I was reading a statement from the PR team. Uh, the only real question is early designs. Is, is it really early designs? Is it a recent um, manifestation of the game who the hell knows but it's going to be an interesting thing to look at over the next couple of days because it's pretty clear that cd project red doesn't uh, want to negotiate with these people so from their perspective uh, they're probably running scared because the authorities have been contacted or they're feeling like okay well you know what they're not going to work with us let's just release it 
let's release, you know, either the screenshots or maybe some video gameplay clips, maybe some stuff of uh, uh, block mesh, right? It's called block mesh. And um, who knows? But that stuff, I mean, it, as soon as you see it, you're going to be like, yep, that's early. That's definitely not where they're at right now. And CD Projekt Red, remember, they are a huge team now. Witcher 3 had a big team as well. Uh, it got bigger or maybe smaller over the expansions, but they really, as soon as they started full production of this game, which I think they're currently in, um, or they announced that a while back, they're at over 300 people at that studio. So it, it's a very, 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 very big team. I mean, we're talking, geez, we're talking probably one of the biggest single development studios in the world, and that's a lot. I mean, it, it probably competes with, you know, studios that, that out of EA or um, working on Star Wars games and stuff. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Battlefront, you know, the new Battlefield, uh, Call of Duty. But um, but I don't know. It'd be pretty interesting to see how this whole situation is going to turn out. And let's move on to, obviously, the game in question, which is Cyberpunk 2077, one of my most anticipated games overall over the next couple of years. You know, it's along there with Death Stranding. It's along there with The Last of Us 2, even though The Last of Us 2 is above everything else. Um, maybe a new Metroid game at Nintendo's press conference. Be on the lookout for that. But um, but I think Cyberpunk is an interesting title because not only is the setting so perfect for them to tackle next because they attack you know the fantasy world of The Witcher and you know that world that was so dense and populated and felt real and it was it, it felt like it was scattered with details everywhere and that's apart from the actual story stuff that was happening in that game and just the depth that you get from the side quests and uh, from the characters and it just felt like everything about that world was meticulous and they, they had a re it had a reason for it being there so I should expect the same amount of detail but even more so because they're not held back they're held back by budgets but at the same time I mean they have more people working there so they could work on more asset creation to make that world specifically because if you're creating a cyberpunk world uh, there's a lot of little details that you could have in there that that make the world feel like a real city, right? A real futuristic city. And there's going to be a lot of unique gameplay stuff that they're going to do. Um, I'm sure it's 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 uh, augmentation is probably going to be played with a little bit. So who knows what they're going to do? But I'm so excited to see that game. There's been rumors about flying cars. Um, you know, I think that this specific open world game will be a little different from The Witcher 3 in the sense that, you know, The Witcher 3 was wide. It was, it was, it took you, what, an hour to get from one point to another, or 45 minutes, um, walking or on a horse. And, um, I think this game will be as big, as detailed, as fleshed out, but it'll be high. It'll be, if you incorporate flying cars, you could start off real low, you can get out of your car, you could walk around, um, at street level. And then you could hop on in your flying car and then you could go to a penthouse or to a club in like the 36th floor of the main, you know, iconic building in that world. Who knows? Who knows what this game's going to have in store, but I believe that they're going to play around with a different kind of mentality for an open world game, which is focus on high instead of focus on wide. So this world will be big, um, but at the same time, I think... They can possibly make a mistake if they go that way because the diversity in the environments might get a little samey. Uh, you know, cities have this problem where, yeah, you do have your parks, you do have your buildings, but if you just walk in a main area, let's say Manhattan or something, you know, it's just everything's a skyscraper, right? It's just you feel overwhelmed. So maybe it has that same feeling of, of feeling like not you not that you're getting crushed or anything but you're feeling a little like everything's claustrophobic right uh you have no space to really breathe and i think if they really tonally focus on that they can make a world that is is really really cool and um i can't wait man the colors are going to be insane in that game um who knows if it's going to visually look better than the witcher 3 just because you know foliage is very hard to make um as far as an open world game, creating a lot of foliage, creating realistic looking foliage. You know, a lot of people were impressed by Horizon's foliage and the fact that it was so um, just wide and expansive and there was, you know, grass, waist high, tall grass everywhere. Um, you know, that stuff is taxing on the, on the, you know, the, the system. So I 
think this game, because it has um, buildings and reflections and glass and all of that stuff, it, it might also have the same intensity of it being taxing on the computer on a PS4 or a PC or whatever. I mean, they have to make it at least run on an Xbox One. So it's going to be interesting to see how this game turns out. But overall, I'm extremely excited because um, we have CD Projekt Red, which has turned into one of the most or the best studios in the world. Um, I think just based off The Witcher 3, they're already on that level. And the goodwill of the expansions and the fact that they released probably one of the best you know, story expansions of all time in Blood and Wine. Um, I personally can't wait to see what they have next. All right, so let's move on to what do we have here? Oh, yeah, the EA E3 press conference. I know I talked about it a little bit at the top, but um, let's focus a little bit on what they have to show us because they apparently said they have eight games. Six of them are confirmed already, which is Star Wars Battlefront, FIFA 18, Madden NFL 18, NBA Live 18, Need for Speed Payback, which I'm about to do a reaction of because I haven't seen it yet, and Battlefield 1. Um, is that 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is 6. And then there's two more. Some people are floating around that it might be Skate. Some people are saying that's the new Star Wars Visceral game, which is obvious. I think that is perfect and to have a trailer for that. Um, you know, you do have that problem where you have multiple Star Wars games coming out, so the confusion of, oh, wait, am I getting the one that I actually want? Or But for them, it doesn't matter. Having two Star Wars games isn't a big issue for them. And then we also have Bioware's um, open-world RPG, which is the most unique uh, for me because I want to see how they bounce back from, obviously, the issues with Mass Effect Andromeda. And they're, you know, they have multiple studios around the world. I think they employ over 600 people. So overall, maybe even more, especially in, in when they're you know, fully producing the game and they're right in the middle of it and they need all the people they can have. Um, I think that, you know, Bioware is, is, is also in an interesting situation because as long as, you know, that specific title is in good hands, um, I think Edmonton is the one that's working on it. Uh, but yet again, I, I want to be able to confirm that. But if it's Edmonton, then we're in good shape. And that game should be very, very impressive. They talked about it having, you know, social features that are going to disrupt, you know, the market or whatever. I know how companies love to say words like that. And but who knows? Maybe maybe it does do, does do something different as a gamer. That personally really, really excites me, especially for an open world RPG. If they do incorporate something very unique um, to that genre, that can be something that wins Game of the Year awards, right? If, if, it, if you really think about it, um, the reason why something like, I guess, Shadow of Mortar was such a huge hit or surprise hit is because it introduced a brand new massive mechanic into the system. And when you have something like that, when you have something like what uh, Breath of the Wild recently did uh, with their physics engine and all of that stuff, I think if you incorporate something very, very unique to that, to the, to the open world RPG genre, that maybe incorporates some social stuff. You know, a lot of people think, oh, it's going to be like The Division. Just let's wait and see. Let's see if they do something creative with it. Not to say that The Division wasn't creative, but um, it wasn't the the thing that I had in my mind when I saw the first gameplay demo of that game. Um, I thought it was going to be uh, like a Daisy version of, uh, of New York, right? Um, I really, really thought it was going to be like that. And having some MMO elements as well, but uh, not some MMO, um, PvP. Anyway, um, you know, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is an interesting title because uh, it seems so much bigger than the first one. So much bigger. And not only from a budget standpoint, but they have the single-player campaign, um, they have multiple eras, uh, you know, they have Rey, they have Yoda... Um, it's just, it, it just seems like the type of game that we always wanted out of them. But at the same time, if the, the gunplay is not as hook worthy as you really want it to be, you know, that gameplay loop that people talk about all the time, um, if that's not where it needs to be, if it's not perfect, then people are still going to have the same issues because at the time, yes, it's awesome that we have Ray. It's awesome that we have Yoda. It's awesome that we have Darth Maul in this and, um, uh, and uh, Kylo Ren, but at the same time, if they don't fix the 
the the gunplay and they don't fix balancing and making sure everything is perfect as far as uh, the online component of the game goes, then people are just going to hop on that story and the story is not going to be as long as you want it to be, even though it does expand uh, spanned, um, across 30 years, which is very, very interesting. So maybe there'll be specific moments. It'll be, it'll be very, very weird to see how they... Uh, they make a five to six hour campaign that stems that that's that spans for 30 years um they'll focus on specific specific moments in in uh, the, that character's life and um maybe they'll they'll incorporate some of the classic heroes uh, um you know the luke skywalkers and they'll incorporate specific moments that intertwine with original trilogy stuff who knows but um, Star Wars Battlefront is interesting for that reason. And the sports games, FIFA, Madden, NBA Live, look like they're all going to get single-player um, journey type of stories. Jesus, is that my... That is my computer. Oh, my God. It is loud as hell. Damn, man. This thing is about to die. Probably need to get a new one. Um, but anyway, so NBA Live is the the... Not the odd one out, but the new one that's coming into the fold because they've been absent for a while. I'm not going to speak too much on that. But basically what I'm trying to say is that they will also have the individual journey stuff. They will have the the story component that, you know, a lot of people seem to enjoy. They seem to be getting good reviews from it. And it just adds another element, you know. The game, the the, the online play and the, the the especially FIFA, it's such a perfectly balanced, realistic, uh, I don't want to call it a simulator, but it... it it, it's so good from a gameplay soccer standpoint. It's so strong that if they incorporate that into NBA Live and then also have that amazing, um, not amazing, but, you know, pretty decent story campaign, I think you can you can compete, you know, over the years. I mean, NBA 2K is, is cornering that market right now, especially with the absence of NBA Live. But um, I think if they incorporate a really, really cool... Uh, story component to it, I think it might bring some people over or make people think twice or make people um, purchase both games, which is, if you're a big NBA guy, if you're a big person that likes to, you know, play basketball and consume the NBA all the time, I think that might be something you might be interested in. And then Battlefield 1 will uh, will get, obviously, their expansions and their season pass stuff going. Uh, Loop Cow, Treacherous Loop Cow will be uh, pass, snow-covered ravines. I, I don't know how to say these words, so I'm not going to even try to say them. But, uh, you know, expansions, you go to different areas, new maps. And Battlefield 1 is the single best sounding game I've ever played. As far as sound design goes, I think it's up there. I If you were to make categories of best games of all time, right? Sound design, gameplay, open world, uh, not open world, but just physics and mechanics and blah, blah, blah. Um, Battlefield 1 would, would be up there top five of all time in sound design. I fully believe that because it, it, it hits you immediately. As soon as you boot up that game, you're like, yep, that's amazing. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the Need for Speed, which was um, the trailer that got released a little while ago. Already has 5.9 million views, by the way. Let me see how much time I have left before this thing uh, farts on me. See, the camera turns off after about 28 to 30 minutes so if i want to shoot with this thing i have to make sure the episode is tight and ends before then but all right we're at 18 minutes so we're good uh need for speed payback official reveal trailer is what we're going to watch right now so let's put on some headphones and uh watch this thing again 5.9 million views a lot of people love these games a lot um you know, I think I was looking at The Last of Us 2, and that has about five or six million views, and it's The Last of Us 2. Um, so, let's take a look. We were a crew, and she left us with nothing. We are going to end this, starting now. Get me close to him, and I'll take care of the rest. There's something much bigger going on here. Jump! Get down! Hey, Matt. You built this all yourself? <laughs> An artist can turn any scrap into a supercar. 
This crew right here, that's the future. We own these streets, Tyler, and the house always wins. Well, not tonight it didn't. Payback, November 10th, 2017, right in the middle of November. You know, it's always it's always been a November release, as far as I remember, maybe October, late October, but um, it's always been a fall release. And, you know, this is an interesting game because not only do you have that fast and the furious kind of element to it, which a lot of people are going to buy and enjoy, the fact that you're going to be playing a fast and the furious style game, um, even though a lot of games maybe have tried to replicate it over the years, um, I believe that this one has probably the right story people involved. And, you know, Need for Speed is about racing at high speeds, but also customizing your car is a big component to that. And, you know, that that foot... That, you know, last year's Need for Speed was, was cool. It was unique. But at the same time... Was it last year? Or was it two years ago? An artist? See, I've been, gone, I've been gone for so long that I have a bad perception of time. Um, the fact that you tell me that I've been away for nine months is... Doesn't even feel like that. But anyway, yeah, Need for Speed is something... A game that... We'll see if it... if it It's obviously going to perform as well as we always thought it was going to perform. But it'll be interesting to see how... How well this performs as compared to different titles. Because, yeah, they do have that story element. So, maybe if Need for Speed pushes in that direction and pushes into the Fast and the Furious lane um, kind of component of, of stealing cars and uh, you know customizing cars and that sense of family that they always want to push all the time then then I think this could be an interesting title I'm going to get it I'm going to review it um, I'll talk about reviews later um, but um, that's something that I definitely want as a component in my channel all right let's move on is this the thing we're talking about right now uh, E3 schedule. Now, I want to, before I get over to the Spider-Man Tom Holland news, um, the fact that he's playing Nathan Drake, I want to talk a little bit about, Jesus, this thing is probably really annoying, isn't it? I'll let that go. The fact that we're talking a little bit about, uh, you know, E3 and, um, and what, you know, what that means for this channel, what are we going to do, and it's going to be pretty much in the same vein as what we did uh, the past two years. So there will be reactions posted um, after, right? Obviously the hardest to um, upload as quickly as possible is going to be the full press conference. So that will always be the last thing, right? Because those things are about an hour and a half long, an hour to an hour and a half. So uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll take a long time to you know for the programs to render it and to export it and to upload it, right? That's the thing that takes the most time. So, um, They'll be the last thing, but I, what I'll try to do is grab, you know, the trailers. If there's uh, an EA press conference, I'll grab the Star Wars Visceral trailer and cut it out and post that up first, okay? Um, or, you know, the... I don't know if there'll be many individual trailers that I'll or demos that I'll react to from the EA press conference. There'll probably be a few Star Wars stuff. There'll probably be maybe some Battlefield 1 expansion stuff, um, season pass stuff, but... Other than that, oh, and obviously, if they announce a new Bioware game or something like that, they they have two unannounced games. So I'm presu I'm assuming it's the Visceral game, and I'm also assuming it's the new Bioware game. All right, you can take that to the bank, unless they completely surprise us. Um, but I do believe that um, that those are the ones that are going to probably pop up at some point in the show. Who knows? Maybe they start and end the show with the two surprises. That would be an interesting kind of development. Um, they'll definitely, definitely, definitely end the show with uh, with some Star Wars stuff. So who knows if it's going to be Star Wars Battlefront or if it's going to be uh, the new Visceral game uh, by e by Amy Henning. Can't believe I almost forgot her name. Okay, so that is it for E3 stuff. That's really all I want to talk about as far as reactions go. But there'll also be press conference videos. I don't know if you ever seen my press conference videos before, but uh, basically they're just like a fun little thing I do that in about five to ten minutes where I just talk about what we just saw like um like if it was some kind of emergency like I need to 
say how I feel because um, especially it'll be interesting to shoot right after each press conference because that's the time when you're either most excited or most down or most angry, right? It's if you shoot right after that, it's pretty. It gets pretty intense just because you know you 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 probably just saw the game of your life end a particular show, right? If it's uh, if they announce Metroid at the Nintendo Direct or the, their press conference, it'll do a direct. Um, then, then filming right after that would be pretty, pretty interesting because I would suspect I would be pretty energetic and pretty excited. All right, so Spider-Man's Tom Holland being Nathan Drake um, is something that I just wanted to put on record, basically. It's not that I, it's something that I want to stay on topic for far too long, but basically, uh, this, is a, this is a movie that I don't really, really want to exist for the pure reason that I just don't feel like they're going to do it right. The fact that Neil Druckmann and nobody at Naughty Dog is being talked to or is being is being um, consulted um, is a little worrying to me. The fact that they're not expressing their opinions on what they should do, what kind of um, what kind of moments the you know the movie needs to hit in order to, for it to feel like an uncharted experience. Um, but at the same time, Sony I don't think is worried too much about the fans. I think they're probably more worried about. Um, making sure that they create a movie that is massive so that they can start their franchise. Because I don't think this movie will be successful if just Uncharted fans watch it. But yet again, I mean, Uncharted is, what, 8, 9 million? Um, yeah, you probably need more people to watch that film in order for it to really, really work. Okay, and now let's move on. Not just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm going to talk a little bit about Tom Holland, why I feel that he's um, not... I wouldn't say the best case scenario. I mean, if it's a story they're trying to go for, a young version of Nathan Drake, I think Tom Holland is going to be fine just because I think he's a good actor. Um, but other than that, I do feel like the movie might get a little, I wouldn't say repetitive, but if, if you've seen the Spider-Man Homecoming trailers, there's this like young kid in high school feel and he's just kind of like, oh, mom, like, why don't you let me just do what I want to do? And that's great. I can't wait to see that movie. But I don't know if that's going to transition as well for an Uncharted film. I don't know if that's going to really, really work. You know, Uncharted 4 specifically tackled that issue. Uncharted 3 as well. Uncharted 3 is apparently going to be the sequence that they're going to be inspired by when making this film. But, um... If you haven't played those games, please, please do. But I think that if you have good acting, right, if you have uh, good producers and you have obviously a good director, um, I feel like you can make something that is believable. Um, but the most important casting in this will be Sully. If they don't nail that Sully casting in order to really ground the film and to bring some tension to it, because if we don't care about Tom Holland as Nathan Drake when we're stepping into the film, then all the crazy stuff that's happening to him in the movie is not going to matter at all. We're not going to care. We're going to fall asleep. So in that sense, they really, really need to nail the relationship between Sully and Tom Holland's Nathan Drake. Because if they don't, it's going to create issues for the film. And um, it's going to make people tune out very, very early on um, in the probably two-hour runtime of it. So... Let's end this rundown with uh, Joel Estee, and he just uh, put up a, a tweet basically saying something across the lines of, if you want to, um, let's see, what is it? let's scroll down, let's move a little. Blah, blah, blah. The scripture tells us to run from temptation. That means don't play games. Your destiny is at stake. So when you read the word temptation, you thought to yourself, yep, they're talking... He's talking about games, video fucking games, or are you just saying overall games goes under the umbrella of temptation, right? Um, but, you know, I, I really think that's a whole bunch of bullshit because everything can be a temptation. I mean, I can mow the lawn for two hours every single day. I could be tempted to do that. It could take, you know, opportunities away from me in those two hours. But if I spend two hours gaming, that's suddenly a, a, a less appropriate temptation, I don't really, really understand that. I mean, I could spend two hours, three hours, four hours doing everything else, and somehow that thing is more acceptable than playing games. Um, I just don't really believe that. I don't think you would say that about films. I don't think you would say, the scripture tells us to run from temptation. That means don't watch movies. Your destiny is at stake. You know why he doesn't say that? Because he watches a hell of a lot of movies, I bet. All those 
Christian ones on Netflix. I bet you he spends every single day of his life watching those. Like, um, what is it? Like God something? Like God is real or something like that. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, this one's obviously blowing up for the reasons that it's an extremely religious guy saying or downplaying the importance of games and, you know, putting it under an umbrella that it's some kind of devious uh, thing you do, which is really, really stupid. And I think if he took the time to really see what games were about, you know, maybe there'll be a game in the future that is heavy, heavily focuses, focuses on religion. I mean, Journey is one of those games that really touches upon death. I mean, we can have an argument about whether or not that game has... So I went over the 30 minutes and the camera turned off again. But what I was saying was that, um, you know, we can have an argument about Journey having religious connotations or not. Um, it's definitely about life. It's definitely about the circle of life and death and stuff like that. But um, we can have an argument about whether they were trying to represent heaven there at the end or whether they were trying to talk about something else. Um, but that's why that game is so interesting that uh, we can have that conversation and we can talk about these really, really serious things that, you know, when, when, when people talk about it, or when people think about it, makes people really uncomfortable. It makes people, you know, uh, not necessarily depressed, but makes people, you know, either down or up, you know, depending on how you feel about certain things. It's a very serious topic. And uh, I think that personally, I think if he took the time to really see what games were all about and whether he's found something like journey that he would like to play then i feel like he'd be fine i feel like he wouldn't he wouldn't say these stupid things but anyway it's not like i'm going to every single show i'm going to talk about oh a famous person talks bad about games here i mean they rarely do but every once in a while you know i just want to put my opinion out there just to have it on record all right so that will be the episode of the morning after and of course um if you have some feedback for me, if you have some things that I that you think I should introduce, um, please give me that. This show is going to be polished uh, further down the line. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that I want to put into this, and uh, you know, there's a lot more intros that I've music that I've worked on. You know, that but that's really tiny stuff that doesn't actually matter in the grand scheme of things when we're talking about the actual episode. But um, but yeah, all right. I will try to do one of these every single morning um, through E3, right? Because I think it'd be cool to just talk about um, either Sony's press conference or Nintendo's or Xbox, uh, Microsoft's uh, press conference the day after just to sleep on it and just think about it a little more rationally because sometimes when you're in the moment, you're just beyond excited and you, you tend to speak a little bit in hyperbole and you tend to, to say grand things that maybe don't represent the actual thing you just saw. Uh, so that's how I feel. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about all these topics in the comments. And of course, um, what did I used to say back in the day? If you hate me, you know what to do. If you like me, you know what to do. And I'll see you guys all in the next one.